was mentioned in the meeting flyer, there's, there's three lessons today. All of them have to do with demands of discipleship because we need to be thinking about being those faithful disciples that the Lord would have us to be, being committed to Him and doing His will and fulfilling our role. We want to keep in mind as we think about being disciples, there are great blessings, indescribable blessings, we might say, with being a disciple of the Lord and having great hope. What, what's maybe one of the top blessings you think of when you think of being a disciple? Salvation. Salvation, the forgiveness of our sins. You know, we, we seek the Lord. We want that relief of the guilt. We don't want the separation between us. We want fellowship with Him, so forgiveness. Yes, having a relationship with God, having that comfort and knowing there's someone to whom we can turn in life when we run into difficulties or when we're facing temptation. Any other thoughts there? So as we think about these great blessings, the, the wisdom that we can gain from God, uh, a promise and anticipation of eternal life, having hope in life. You know, there's some people who don't have hope in this life. And some, they get to the point that there's zero hope. They end up actually taking their own life. Well, as the disciple of Christ is one committed to him, we have hope. There's something better. No matter what we may face here, there's something better. And so it helps to keep us moving forward and to endure maybe the difficulties and trials we face. But being a disciple also demands certain things of us. Yes, there's blessings, but there's also demands. Um, it's not left up to us to follow our own course. It's not as though we have the right and we really don't even have the ability to direct our lives properly. We simply lack that knowledge, that understanding, that wisdom. And there's greater authority that is over us that is... <coughs> To guiding us and directing us in life and we have a greater cause in which we're involved and when we get involved in this great cause of Christ it means our priorities in life change and we have to take on the priorities that he gives to us and directs us in so let's read now Luke verse uh, chapter 9 verses 57 through 62 Luke 9, 57 through 62. Who can I get to volunteer to read that for us? As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. To another he said, Follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, Leave the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Yet another said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those at my home. Jesus said to him, No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. All right. So the first thing we want to note is there in verses 57 and 58 where a man claims and says, I'll follow you wherever you go. And in the Lord's response, we see what's going on here. And basically, the idea is there are discomforts associated with being a disciple. And when he says, I'll follow you wherever you go, over in Matthew's account, in Matthew chapter 8, if you just want to take a quick peek there. Matthew chapter 8 and verse 19 and 20. Well, just 19. Who, who is it that's coming to him here and say, I'll follow you wherever you go? A scribe. A scribe. Okay. It's interesting that Matthew notes that it's a scribe. What do we know about scribes? Who are they? What kind of people are they? they? What's their vocation or occupation in life? Writing. Prophesying? No, they, they wouldn't be prophets particularly, but the writing. And writing of what? 
the law. Hey, writing the law. They, they, part of their job was copying the law, writing the law out. So these men, just in copying that, would be very familiar with the law. Now, whether they understood it correctly or not is another issue, but they, they knew what it said. Um, so he was trained in transcribing the law. He was a student of God's word. And inasmuch as he comes to the Lord and says, I will follow you, what do we know about this particular man? What's his outlook in life, his disposition? Most of the scribes were opposed to Jesus. Okay, we're going to touch on that a little bit more in a second, but that's exactly right. But this man, what is he? If he's going to Jesus and he says, I'll follow you wherever you go. Okay, he, he believes. In fact, you go over to Matthew chapter uh, 8 again, and it says in verse 21, then another of his disciples said to him. So Matthew's indicating that this first man, the scribe, was a disciple of the Lord. So he respected Christ enough to commit to following him. I mean, that's his verbal declaration, right? I will follow you wherever you go. And as was mentioned a, a moment ago, this is contrary to most scribes. How did most scribes view Jesus? What when we read about them, when we think about them in the New Testament, what kind of people were they? Well, it's, it says a lot of times the scribes and the Pharisees. Okay. And what do we know about those people? You might just take a look at Matthew 15. Matthew 15. And verses 1 and 2 here. This is one of the more prominent texts in my mind where Jesus deals with the scribes and the Pharisees, but what is it they're concerned about? Verse 1 says the scribes and Pharisees who were from Jerusalem, they came to Jesus and verse 2 tells us, what, where's their focus? Okay, they're hypocrites. What, what do they bring up to Jesus that he then responds to? Now, wash your hands. These traditions of the elders, the traditions of men, that's, they were caught up into that. That's, that would be the typical scribe. Uh, when you get over to Matthew chapter 20, Matthew chapter 20, verses 18 and 19. If I could get someone to read that for us. Matthew 20, 18 and 19. This is Jesus talking to his disciples. Is that 18 and 19? Please. Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and to the scribes, and they will condemn him to death, and deliver him to the Gentiles to mock and the scourge and the crucify, and the third day he will rise again. Okay. Jesus here tells beforehand one of the main groups that's going to be responsible for my suffering and death is the scribes. They absolutely, as a group, generally speaking, despised Jesus, they hated Him, they wanted to get rid of Him, and they were intimately involved in taking Him to Pilate, to the Romans, to have Him executed on the cross. So, that's the typical scribe. But this man, in Luke chapter 9, he comes to Jesus and is a different man. He expresses a difference. Um, what is it that he's wanting, do you think, when he says, I will follow you wherever you go? Why would he declare that? Well, typically in kind of rabbinical tradition, becoming a disciple meant you did follow them wherever they went, but you were seeking to, to learn about the Scriptures more fully. Okay, this man is studious. He wants to know. So he recognizes Jesus at this point is someone sent of God. He looks at him, perhaps we don't have it explicitly stated, but as Messiah. Now the Jews at this time, the disciples even, you know, Peter, James, John, 
They didn't fully comprehend what that meant, even though there were multiple occasions when they said, we believe you're the Christ, the Son of God. They didn't fully get that until later. But this man obviously sees Jesus has wisdom. He has knowledge from which I can benefit, and I want to be around him. I want to, follow, I want to learn what he has to say. So that's a great attitude, right? Anybody who says, I want to follow Jesus, wherever you go, that's where I want to be. I will be with you, I'll walk with you, I'll learn from you. So he says, I will follow you wherever you go. Where might Jesus go? Where did he go in his lifetime? Okay, he was within the land of Israel for the most part. Except for he, he did go over to Tyre and Sidon. He, he made it out a little bit. But he's traveling around, so he's going to various places. He's going throughout the hill country. He, he's traveling through the deserts of Judea at times. He's up in the northern part of the country. But this scribe's saying, wherever you go, if it's in the mountains, in the valleys, I'll go. If, if it's wherever, I'll go. And one of the things he would be doing in this is going away from friends and going away from family. Because Jesus didn't just stay where this man grew up or all his family was. So he's saying, I'm, I'm willing to make you a priority in my life. But what's the Lord's response in Luke 9, 58? He says the foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but he has nowhere to lay his head. So what, he's, yeah, what's he telling the man here? He's indicating that it's going to be harder maybe than this man imagined. Yeah, this, this is something you need to think about. When, when you say you'll follow me wherever I go, here's the reality of it. it it's a, a case where animals have homes, but not the Son of Man. You know, it's interesting, back he got to even his birth, what does the New Testament tell us about the time of his birth but it notes something that tells us well without giving it away sometimes I ask vague questions so I apologize for that but where was he actually literally born okay stable in, in the manger there was no room in the inn for them so he didn't even when he came into this world he didn't even have that to be in an inn, a, a proper room, if you will, that's been fixed and suitable for people to, to stay in, to rest in. But he's, he's out where the animals are. He, all of his life, he was not one who lived a life of luxury and ease. And that's part of what challenged the Jews in seeing who he is. That he, he's a king, but here he is, he's, you know impoverished he's he's from nazareth of all places and here jesus declaring why well, I, I don't have anywhere to lay my head he depended on the lord and his providence to look out for him and to provide for him and he's telling this scribe here that's the way it's going to be if you're with me now then let's make a few observations here first the scribe was a self-motivated volunteer because he goes to the Lord, he says, I will follow you. He's raising his hand, as it were. Good attitude, bad attitude? Good. Right? We look at it. Oh, that's great. That's very noble. That's very honorable of him. But he needed to consider the true implication that there would be struggles, there would be sacrifices. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians 5, and let's grab verse 17 here. Thinking about what it means to become a disciple of Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17. Who will read that for us? Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. Okay. You're a new creature. And the idea is this is a new life. Life as it was will not continue. It's changed now. And so there are going to be things 
where you are uncomfortable in life. What kind of things may Christians be involved in that others don't get to enjoy? So keep it in the context of what he's telling the man. Foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests. Son of man has nowhere to lay his head. So there's discomfort there. Is there any discomfort you can think of that disciples experience maybe week to week, month to month? Persecution for what's good. Like if, if someone becomes a Christian, they'll get persecuted by the world. But if you think about it, anybody who's persecuted for what's good can avoid not only going to hell, but avoiding what the world is a part of. Yes, yes. Staying faithful, staying true, and people do not like that, and so they will attack someone who's faithful to the Lord. Any other thoughts there? Let so, me ask you this. You ever stay up late at night reading Scripture? Like, I'm dead dog tired, but I need to open up the Word today. Or you get up early to read Scripture. It's not comfortable, right? We... <laughs> All of us, to some degree or another, like to get our rest. And sometimes we're just worn out. But because we're committed to the Lord, I'm going to put forth the effort and I'm going to study His Word. I'm going to take time to read through a chapter, two chapters, three chapters, whatever it is, to think, to meditate, to contemplate on that, to make some notes. I'm going to do that. Same with prayer. You know what, I need to pray before I go to bed. I am absolutely exhausted. But I've got to pray before I go to bed. Because I do not want to lay down and go to sleep and not have done that today. It's uncomfortable at times. It truly is. Can you think of anything else? A lot of people are using today to fish, read the newspaper, watch football, rest. And while it is a blessing, it's also a discomfort to, to come here and, and to study the Bible, get everybody ready and things like that. What do we have ahead of us this week, Micah? <laughs> Meeting every night. Yeah. For some people in the world, that is insanity. Why would you do that? Why would you go every night? Why, why would you go through that trouble? Isn't one or two nights okay? Why would you go every night? Well, it's because we raised our hand. We said, Lord, I'll follow you wherever you go. And as a group of God's people, hey, this is, this is where we're going to be, gathered together in the presence of God, worshiping Him, studying Him, being strengthened in the truth. Is it uncomfortable? Is it difficult? I see a lot of little ones here. There are challenges and getting the children together, getting them here. While you're here, you're wrestling with them, dealing with different things. That's, that's a challenge. For those who are more senior, you know, it can be a challenge. You're, you're uncomfortable. Yes, sir? I just want to say to a faithful Christian, it's, unfaith it's uncomfortable to fail to do those things. If you... If you <coughs> If you're accustomed to read the scriptures every day and then you, you don't do it, it bothers you. It does me. Or, or pray. Right. Exactly right. And but that doesn't discount the fact that if I'm staying up late, if I'm taking that or getting up early because you know I gotta be at work at six AM well, I'm, I need to get up extra early and take 30 minutes to read and pray this morning. I need to do that. That's just a part of my life. But we, we do that. We, and we're committed to these things. Even though there are challenges, even though there are inconveniences, we're ready to do that because the Lord's telling him this is how it's going to be. It's not going to be a comfortable life, a life of ease and luxury. You're, you're going to have to make some sacrifices. Because that's where I am, and if that's where you want to be, then that's what you're going to go through. There's going to be some deprivation at times. So we have to be consistent in our commitment to the Lord, knowing there are going to be things that are not comfortable at times. 
And let's understand that following Jesus is not an academic exercise. If you jump back over to Luke chapter 9, verse 23. Luke 9, 23. Who will read that for us? Then he said to them all, If any one desires to come after me, let him deny himself. Take up his cross daily and follow me. Okay. So this scribe needed to understand, look, coming with me is not just an academic thing. You know, some people, all they want to do is, is academic things. In Athens, in Acts chapter 17, it said they spent their time in the Areopagus just to hear and learn something new, right? It's just information, information. Well, it's not just about information or knowledge in being with Jesus. So it's not just academic, but there are things to do and there are difficulties to endure. So the question is, are we willing to go wherever he leads us? We need to ask ourselves that. Well, let's get to the next one then. Luke 9, again, verses 59 and 60. Notice again, it says, Then he said to another, Follow me. So the Lord's calling on him to follow him. What's that man's response in verse 59? Yeah. So in other words, he's saying, Yes, but let me first take care of this. I need to go bury my father. We noted over Matthew's account that it says that this man is another disciple. Right, so he's, he's a believer in the Lord, and the Lord's calling him to come with him. Now, it could be, when you look into the New Testament, it could be this man is one of the ones that was essentially that core group that traveled with Jesus. When you get to Acts chapter 1, they're looking to replace uh, Judas on that occasion. It tells us that there were more people than what we consider the 12 apostles that had traveled with Jesus from the time of the baptism of John to his ascension back into heaven. You know, Matthias and Barsabas were in that group, and there probably were others. So it could be that this man is one of those. It could be he's one of the 70 that Jesus sent out. But whoever it is, he's telling him, come and follow me. Well, I need to first and go to bury my father. What? Well, I'll say this. Some of us, the relationship we have or had with our Father wasn't the best of relationships. But for others, there are good relationships. Maybe even the Father and Son are the best of friends. But in this culture, no matter what, it was absolutely a part of their psyche to respect their parents. And part of that, of course, would be in their death. And doing things that are honorable for them when they die. Now the question is, on this man, did his father just die that day? Why, why might he say, I need to go bury my father if his father had died that day? Does anybody know about their burial customs, practices? Maybe I have them, um, spices and ointment prepared for the bodies and stuff. They, they would have that, most certainly. Let me ask you this. When do, when do we generally bury people? Depends if they're embalmed or not embalmed. That's the first thing. So if they're not embalmed, it's within 24 hours, I believe, and then after that. Okay, I, did, I wasn't even aware that they even allowed not embalming these days. I, I thought that was customary, so I learned something new. Um, generally, it's, you know... Three days is about the shortest I've ever seen it to actually go and, you know, go to the graveyard. But there's some, it might be a month sometimes. But back here in the first century among the Jews, they would bury them either that day or very early the next day, depending on when they had passed the, the day before. But they, they would do it very rapidly. So... It could be, this is a case where he's like, my father's died, I need to go take care of this. It could also be where his father was sick, they believed death was imminent, 
Well, I need to go. I'm anticipating him dying. I need to help the family to take care of all these things. But Kyle Pope, in his commentary on Matthew, says it could be another custom among the Jews as well. And that's what we might call a second burial. Remember, they would put the people, the body, into the tomb, and they would allow that body to decay. A year later, they would go in and gather up the bones and put them in an ossuary box. And then they would have a second burial ceremony at that time. And it could be that's what this is. He's saying, I need to go do that. So however it is, any of those situations would be time-consuming for him to go do. Anywhere from a couple of days to several weeks. Day two. Uh, reason why uh, on the third day the body starts breaking down and stinking, and uh, they want to do this as quick as possible so that he won't do, get to that stage. Exactly right. Like when they went out to Lazarus' tomb, it says you know his body stinks by now because he'd been in there for four days at that time. So exactly right. Well, the Lord, when the man says, "Let me go first and bury my father," what does Jesus tell him? Verse sixty. Luke 9, 60. Let the dead bury the dead. What's he saying, let the dead bury? Does that sound like Jesus is dismissive of this man's relationship with his father? Sounds like it. Okay. When Jesus in other places says, if you don't hate father and mother, to our ears that sounds like, Ouch. But what's the Lord really saying here? There's something more important. Yes, there's something more important. He's not just simply saying, well, your, da your dad doesn't matter, your father doesn't matter, your family doesn't matter. That's not what he's saying. He's trying to get this man to focus on the idea of what really matters. Let the dead, the spiritually dead, bury the dead, the physically dead. Let them take care of that, but you go and preach the kingdom of God. You know, the Lord calls us to follow Him. There's the gospel call for us to come to Him and to do His will. But people come up with all kinds of reasons why they can't. Let's go over to Luke 14. Luke 14, let's read verses 16 through 24. So this is a little bit longer reading, but if I could ask someone to read 16 to 24 for us. <clears throat> but he said to him, A man was giving a big dinner, and he invited many. And at the dinner he sent his slave to say to those who had been invited, Come, for everything is ready now. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first one said to him, I have bought a piece of land, and I need to go out and look at it. Please consider me excused. Another one said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I am going to try them out. Please consider me excused. Another one said, I have married a wife, and for that reason I cannot come. And the slave came back and reported this to his master. Then the head of the household became angry and said to his slave, Go out at once into the streets and lanes of the city, and bring in here the poor and crippled and blind and lame. And the slave said, Master, what you commanded has been done, and still there is room. And the master said to the slave, Go out into the highways and along the hedges and compel them to come in so that my house may be filled. For I tell you, none of these men who were invited shall taste of my dinner. All right. Let me ask you something. You buy a piece of land? Is that kind of important? You buy oxen? You marry a wife? Oh, marry a wife. I can't come. Each of these, to our mind, is rational and reasonable. I, I've, I bought some land. I, I've got to go take care of that. I have five yoke of oxen. I've just invested in that. It's very important to me and my crops. And I've, you know, or maybe he hauls stuff and he has wagons. But whatever the reason he has oxen, I, I need to go test them out. Well, I have a wife. Okay, I'll just ask the husbands here. Are wives a priority in our lives? Are they important? Yeah. I hope so. 
So you, you think about what these men are saying. They're saying something that many of us would go, yeah, that makes sense. That's rational. You, you've got some things you, you have to take care of and you, you need to do. But how does the Lord view these things? Like the meeting we're having, you invite somebody to say, Well, I have all this stuff to take care of. And if they put that before the Lord, and it's just like, you know, it, when it comes to the Lord, people tend to put things before God that are kind of unimportant as to something that, that, like worshiping the Lord, that's important. But when people make up some excuse that they can't come, then, you know, you, you think in the back of your mind, you know, they're. They're missing out and they're going to miss out on something good. Okay. All right. The Lord, in the way that he's giving this here, he's the one inviting people to a supper. God's inviting people to a supper. This great feast. And they come up with these excuses. He does not accept any of those excuses. Because verse 24, what does he say? None that were invited will, will come to this dinner. Yeah. I don't accept any of those excuses. Doesn't matter how rational, how reasonable it sounds, I'm not accepting that. See what down 27, 28 too. It just that fish I sound right Yes, that's where he gets into you don't hate father and mother. It, you know, you need to love me. You, need, you cannot be my disciple, even hating your own life. Exactly right. So we have to recognize and reject excuses. It's, and it's not just the, the people that we invite to do. We have to look at us. What kind of excuse am I giving and diverting myself away from serving the Lord? Doing what I need to be doing. Because all these other things are just so important. You know, you think about a time of mourning as the, the one man had talked about there. You think about the things that people come up with. Um, you know, family relationships don't take priority. I've known of Christians that, oh, I got family in town. I need to stay Sunday and prepare lunch for them. Where's that person's priority in life? And what, what is their issue? There are some people who because of cultural customs will set aside serving the Lord. Weddings. Funerals. Are those important in our culture? Yeah, those are important. Is a wife important? Yeah, a wife's important. But you think about it. People put ball games before church services and Bible classes. They're doing exactly what the Lord is dealing with both in Luke 9 and Luke 14. Well, there's something else that, that matters more to me that I really want to focus on. I want to put first before you, Lord. But what we need to do is have a conviction in our hearts and minds that the kingdom of God, its work and service in the kingdom takes precedent over everything else in our life. Well, I'll add to that if you're doing what you're supposed to do, your family's not going to ask you to do that. They know where you they know where you are on Wednesday night, Sunday morning, Sunday night. They don't even expect you to do that because they know you are worshiping God. So then I question Depends on whether you set that precedent, yes. Right. <laughs> and whether the because they're and, and I get what you mean. Generally speaking, that's what happens. They know who you are. And you're going to do, but even at times when the family may not expect it, people, but it's a weakness in them. It's a weakness in them. Mike. You know, when, when looking at these excuses in, in Luke 14, uh, it, it's interesting because at first they seem kind of rational, but if you just sit and think about them for just a moment, they kind of fall apart. Who goes and buys land without having looked at it first? Who buys a bunch of oxen without having tested them first? Um, and why can't you come to dinner if you've just married a wife? Why not bring her along? You know, these, these kinds of things. Um, and, and whether you can you know, reason out those uh, excuses here a little bit more, 
point I'm trying to make is that sometimes our excuses, when you sit and think about them for more than five seconds, they're not very good. Right, exactly right. Just looking for a reason not to do it. And we grab onto what we can or try to. Very good. Yes, sir. I'm, I'm kind of, I like your point on, on 26 where it says, if anyone comes to me and does not hate. Mm -hmm. Are you asking what that's referring to? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's really saying love less. Now, it's, it's a very strong word in hate there, but there are other commands, honor your father and mother, you know, you're to love your wife, you're to love your children. But what it's saying here, Jesus is putting it in stark terms, you, you love them less than you love me. You love me, Jesus, more than anything or anyone. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right, very good. Let's jump back to Luke 9 now, verses 61 and 62, the next individual where he says, Lord, I will follow you, but let me first go and bid them farewell who are at my father's house. It's very similar to the previous one. And he's somebody who's volunteering. Remember, in the previous one, the Lord told him, follow me. In this one, the man is raising his hand saying, I will follow you. So he's taking the initiative here to be with the Lord. But he wants to first go and say his goodbyes. And the Lord's response, no one having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. Let's look at Colossians chapter 3. Colossians 3, reiterating the point that, you know, this is a different life now. Colossians 3, verses 9 and 10 here. Who will grab that for us? Colossians 3, 9 and 10. Go ahead. Do not lie to one another since you have put off the old man with his deed and have put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. Okay. So we put off the old man. We put on the new man. It means that that old life has to be put away. And those old relationships, whatever they were, they are secondary to our service to God. Um, <coughs> what happened to Lot's wife? She looked back after Lot's family were heading out of the city and then she turned around and she was turned into a pillar of dust. Okay. She was looking back either because she regretted what was happening, she missed her life there, she was longing for that, family there, whatever it was, she's, she's looking back at that instead of going forward as God had told her to go, that they needed to get out. And it just serves as a great illustration and the point Jesus is making, you can't look back at that old life. What, what do people look back at in their old life and wish they still had? The good times. To define that. Maybe give an example. When you first got married, had any loves, had you get away from marriage, it was seasoned. <laughs> okay, okay. Somebody who becomes a Christian, they they probably don't want to go back to that. Maybe they want to go back to that, but it's not a compromise to the Lord to rekindle the love, the affection between husband and wife. That would actually be a good thing. But sometimes they look back, and maybe it is, I wish I didn't have to go to church every Sunday and every Wednesday. Wow, I'd really like to be hiking. The weather's great today. I really wish I could still do that with all my friends because I know they're out there. That's a pool. Right? Some people, they want to go back into sin because they had fun in sin. You ever hear a Christian talk about you know their days when they were youthful and they were wild and they talk about it almost like they're bragging. You know, I've heard them say something like yeah I used to drink so much I could blow a house. Well, that's nothing to be proud of or to take flippantly. That was sin. But sometimes people look back at all those things before they became a Christian they, they want to go back to that. They wish, they long for it. 
But Jesus says, you put your hand to the plow and you look back, what are you? Not fit for the kingdom. What does that mean? Like, if you say a person decides they want to convert to Christianity and they become Christians, they, they accept the baptism of Jesus and then they decide they want to be partial of God, be part of the kingdom, and then be a part of the world at the same time, they're not fit because they're, they're double-minded and they don't know what they want to do in their life. Double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Exactly right. Uh, look at Hebrews 12, verse 1. We're going to come back to that, though, being not fit. Hebrews 12, verse 1. Let me get a volunteer to read that. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a crowd of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Okay. Lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. This man talking to Jesus saying, Let me go bid farewell to those of my father's house, that's a weight that he needed to set aside. Family relationships are not sinful in and of themselves. But they can be a distraction to us. They can be a weight that drag us down from serving the Lord and not doing what we ought to be doing. Sometimes there's a tension between competing duties and obligations. We have those points of decision that we have to make in our lives. And sometimes it, it can be a real challenge for us. But we have to take care not to misprioritize and take our focus off the kingdom. Our parents, our grandparents, aunts, uncles, cousins, they don't come before the Lord. The Lord comes first, always. But we have a real struggle sometimes when it comes to our family relationships. Yeah, it's, it's interesting how well, I, can, I can be upset at brother so-and-so because he said this or he didn't do that, and I not talked to him for a year. I'll avoid him at every service because he just made me angry. Then you have a wayward family member or somebody who's living a wicked life and you just have to see them and talk to them every day or every other day. We have to put the Lord first and be committed to doing His will. What does it mean not to be fit for the kingdom? It's very plain very bluntly. You don't belong. You're going to go to hell. That's what that means. You're not fit. Right? Jesus said salt has lost its flavor. What's it good for? Good for nothing. He says literally good for nothing. So we have to take very seriously what the Lord's calling us to. We, we can have all kinds of things in our mind about, well, this is important in my life. I need to bury my father. I need to see my family. There are things I have to deal with. Well, the Lord has to come first. Being a disciple has great and wonderful blessings. But let's understand there are discomforts and there are sacrifices involved with being a disciple. If we're not ready to commit to that, we're not ready to be a disciple of the Lord. If we are a disciple, and we've weakened on those things, we need to renew and redouble our effort to be committed to doing His will. So we'll wrap up the class there. Appreciate everyone's participation.